sticking underneath the baseboard or underneath whatever, uh, just just bring them and uh, put them back. We'll use them. We'll shoot someone again another day. Welcome. Glad to have you here this evening. This is actually the last service that you'll have the opportunity this year, uh, or at least in, in this week of meetings, to hear Brother Duke preach. Uh, so we're going to try not to take up a lot of time with announcements and special things. But for the teenagers, it's not over for us. We're going to be having a, uh, uh, we're going to have pizza, hot dogs, and nachos after this. And then we're going to have a game, and then we'll have our last service and uh, have the prize, let everybody know who won, the Waterproof Bible. And these are quite a commodity. I, I really didn't realize, uh, I, I had seen before some years back, waterproof Bibles. And I thought, oh, that, I guess that'd be handy if your Bible got wet. And Bibles do get wet sometimes. And uh, since, uh, since I saw my first waterproof Bible, or we had the first one we gave out as a prize last year, I realized the value of them. There are a lot of people that would really like to have one of these, and someone's going to win this one, the person who brought the most visitors uh, for the Teen Revival services. And these are pretty handy. Last year we put one of these in the baptistry, and uh, this one here actually floats. So it could be a life preserver for all another night. It was really downpouring. How was that storm on Friday night? Did you like that? It's Friday night, that storm that came down upside down, sideways, all directions. That was something. Well, while we took this outside in the storm and held it up like this, and then brought it in and went like this, squeezed it together. The water all came out on the edge and just wiped it off. Ooh, good, go. And so, anyway, this is the prize for the teenagers. And uh, you may want to consider having one of these. Brother Duke has graciously allowed us to make his personal waterproof Bible the prize this year. I intended to order one, didn't in time. Brother Duke said, I have one. And it has uh, actually has his signature inside of his name in it and a couple of his notes. And so this is not just a waterproof Bible. This is a waterproof Bible that's autographed by Evangelist Dustin Duke. And so that's quite a prize. And I'm looking forward to giving this out. It might be if this is if you're the one that wins the prize, you may be able to auction it off, I suppose, with the modifications to it. You know, they're probably worth about fifty dollars regularly, but with the autographed and uh, notated copy like this one is that can be authenticated. We can actually authenticate this one, and we may have to write a letter, letter of authenticity to go with it. But uh, it is probably probably worth at least a thousand bucks, I'm guessing. So anyway, uh, and then also don't forget, teenagers, that I'm giving away prizes of Curiously Strong Mints, the original celebrated Altoids cinnamon flavor. I've got some more of those. Uh, most of these are going to be given away before the night is over. So that's, that's coming up. Uh, as far as announcements go, they're, they're everything that you need to know as far as the church goes is in the church bulletin. Men, if you'd like to participate in a men's retreat, uh, please see Brother Lee or Brother Charlie for the information about the flight and registration and those sort of things. You're welcome to come along on it. We, most of us ordered, nine of us have already gotten our tickets, our airline tickets. And I cannot fix a price for airlines on airline tickets. That changes from week to week. And so I recommend that you get your tickets as soon as possible. And uh, we, we all bought together last week, but because what happens is when about 10 of us buy tickets, then the price goes up. And so, sorry, you should have joined us, should have been in on it. We, we tried to get everybody we could. Uh, so hopefully they'll, they'll be not too unreasonable. All right, that's all for announcements. So we'll have our offering guys. That's you, Sir Salcedo. All right, come on up. And uh, Charlie, will you pray, please pray for the Lord's blessing on the offering as well? Sure. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Uh, Lord, thank you for this privilege to be able to uh, give unto your portion of what you've given to us. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would multiply it and we'd be able to see much done uh, with what comes in and being able to reach uh, South Florida and the world for you. And Lord, now I pray that uh, also um, uh, as we give, Lord, that uh, you'd have just freedom uh, and uh, to speak to our hearts uh, through the preaching and uh, through the rest of the portion of the service, I pray in Jesus' name. Joe. If you're a young person, I'm going to challenge you to sit up straight in your seat, keep your heads up, and look at your Bibles and follow along, or you're going to fall asleep. All right? So sit up straight and pay attention so you can hear what's going on. From the Bible. It's been a long day. We've had a blast. This is our one, two, 
before. This is our fifth church service of the day, isn't it? Yes. And uh, one more to go tonight for the teens. This is a great day. And uh, so I hope everybody's been enjoying it. Do you need a Bible? <coughs> Very good. You got an extra Bible we can funnel over here to Mr. Jeff? Is that Fuji? It is, isn't it? Get the, hey, get that Thank Bible. They should be here. Job chapter one. Job chapter one. All right. Job's right near the center of your Bible. All right. Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Get you in the right position there. Going to be in Job chapter number one. We're going to look at chapter number one and the first part of chapter number two here uh, tonight. All right. Um. Young people, church members, as an evangelist, I get the privilege to preach messages more than one time. Um, this message I've only ever preached one time before because I don't like to preach it. Can I just be honest? There are some messages I just hate. I just hate to preach. But this is what God's laid on my heart uh, for tonight. And I just want you to know I wish I could preach something else. Okay? But I'm going to preach it because I believe it's what God's laid on my heart for us here tonight, okay? The title of the message tonight is The Desires of Satan. The Desires of Satan, okay? Uh, we've been talking a lot about God uh, on Friday and on Saturday, uh, on Sunday, all day today, and I'll tell you, I love talking about God. I love talking about His graciousness. I love talking about His mercy. I love talking about the fact that He loved us so much that He gave His Son to die on the cross for us. I love to talk about those things. That's what I would rather talk about. That's what I would rather focus on, but you know what? The Bible does address uh, Satan. He is real. He is alive. And uh, he has desires for you as well. You know, all of God's desires for you are good. Isn't that, isn't that just a blessing? Yeah. He wants only what is best for you in your life. And Satan wants to destroy you. That's his desire. Satan's desire is to destroy each and every person in this room. Okay? And I just want us to look and to see... In this passage, in the book of Job, like no other passage in all of Scripture, we have a window to look into the desires and the heart of Satan and what he's trying to do to each and every one of us. Okay? And we would be amiss if we didn't talk about this. I, I'd love to talk about something else, okay? but I'm going to talk about this subject tonight, and I believe it'll be a help to us. And I hope, just can I just be honest with you, I, ho I hope it scares the living daylights out of you. It scares the living daylights out of me. Because we're not talking about fairy tales when we look at the Bible. We're talking about what's actually real. And here I want us to see from the book of Job how Satan desires to treat you. You know, Job is considered to be actually the oldest written revelation in Scripture. A lot of people think Genesis was the first book that was ever written. But it wasn't. Job was the first book that was written. Now, Genesis talks about the beginning, so it talks about a time that was before this. But most people think that Job was the first book of the Bible that was ever written. And I want you to consider this. Look in verse number 6 down there. The Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who? Satan, Satan came also among them. Listen, in the first written revelation of the Bible, it takes six verses before we're introduced to Satan. He's important for us to know about. It only takes six verses. Six verses of the Bible, the very first word of God that was ever given to anybody, six verses into it, we learn about the presence of Satan. Okay? The next, the second oldest book of the Bible would be Genesis. Genesis okay? Genesis chapter 1 tells about the creation of the world. Genesis chapter 2 tells about the creation of man. Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning of recorded history. Verse number 1, Satan walks onto the scene as the serpent in the garden. God wants us to know that the devil is alive. God wants us to know that the devil is real. And God here in the book of Job has exposed to us so that we can know the desires of Satan for our life. I just want to look at it. Uh, it won't take me too terribly long tonight to look at this, but I want us to get an idea of this person, Job, and so I want us to just read the first few verses here of Job chapter 1. So pick it up there with me in verse number 1, all right? Job chapter 1, verse number 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright. He was complete, 
All right, he still sinned, but he was complete, he was upright, and he feared God, and he eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. He was a blessed man, wasn't he? He had a large family. He had ten kids. All right, you see that? There were seven boys, and there were three girls. He had seven sons, and he had three daughters. And then look in verse 3. God has really blessed Job. He said his substance was also 7,000 sheep. Now, I'm glad I don't have 7,000 sheep, all right? But Job was a wealthy man. He was absolutely wealthy. God had really blessed him. He had 7,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels. Now, I don't know if they had one hump or two humps, but whatever. He probably had 1,500 of one hump ones and 1,500 two hump ones, right? But, but nonetheless, he had 3,000 camels, okay? So he had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. Look at this. 500 yoke of oxen. Now, a yoke, in my mind, that would be a pair of them, right? So he had 1,000 oxen. A thousand of them. And I think, you know, it would be a pain and a chore for me to just take care of and feed one horse. Right? <laughs> so in order to do this, he had to have servants, he had to have staff, he had to have land, he had to have facilities, he had to have access to food, and all these different things. Job was a great man. Uh, God had really blessed him. So he had 500 yoke of oxen there. He had 500 she-asses, those are donkeys. And he had a very great household. That's just talking about the servants and all the things that went into taking care of all of the animals and so on and so forth. So that this man was the greatest. You see that? This man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of all them. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Job was a man who loved his family. Uh, he offered sacrifices on behalf of his family. He, did, he loved his family. You know, God had blessed him. He was one of the greatest men, or he was the greatest man in the East, and he had been blessed with a wonderful family. He had a wife. He had ten children. He had all these possessions, and all that was there. All right? And then uh, look at verse number 6. We already read it. But there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord has a conversation with Satan in verse number 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? In other words, where have you been? Okay, He says, where have you been, Satan? And then remember uh, earlier today when I told you that Satan didn't live in hell and that wasn't his home, but that he was walking about in the earth? Okay, here it is. All right, look at it here in verse number 7. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Hast thou not blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land? All right, so Satan says, Look, he has this conversation with God. Yeah, yeah, Job's great, man. You've got a hedge of protection about him. I can't get to him, is what that means. Uh, God had blessed and protected this man, Job, and Satan was unable to get to him. And so Satan said, well, yeah, no wonder no wonder he, he, he blesses you. I mean, you just protect him and you've given him all these different things and he has these great possessions. He has this wonderful family, right? Of course he, of course he loves you and blesses you. But look in verse number 11. Now, this is Satan, what Satan wants to do. Satan says, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. In other words, says, take away everything that he has, and then he won't love you anymore. That's what Job here says uh, to the Lord. And the Lord says unto Satan in verse number 12, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day, verse number 13, you hanging with me? All right. There was a day, verse number 13, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Now everybody look up here, and I want to make a point of clarification. All right? In the Old Testament especially, when the Bible refers to wine, it's not the wine that you and I think that it is. Okay? It's grape juice. All right? Back in the day, if you looked up wine in a dictionary a long time ago, you would see a whole bunch of different definitions. The same word was used to refer to grape juice, and the same word was used to refer to alcohol. Okay? Now, God condemns the consumption of alcohol in the Word of God. That's not what they were doing here. Okay? They were just... Drinking, you can get it from the context. I believe they were drinking grape juice here, right? They were drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And then verse number 14, And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away, 
Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped to tell thee. You know what the first thing is that Satan desires to do? Satan desires to destroy your substance. Satan desires to destroy your possessions. He desires to take everything that you have, everything that you work for in life, everything that you own, everything that you consider to be yours, Satan wants to destroy. He wants to take it from you. He wants to rip them away from you. All right, now we have already read what were the possessions that he had. He had 7,000 sheep, right? How many camels did he have? 3,000, right? 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a very great household, all of his servants to take care of that. In verse number 14, the Bible says, There came a messenger, the oxen were plowing, the ashes feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them, and they took them away. Just like this, everything that he had was gone. Why was it gone? Because Satan got his way. Satan desires, Satan desires to destroy your substance. All right? A thousand oxen, 500 donkeys were taken by the Sabians. The servants were murdered. 7,000 sheep and numerous servants were burnt alive. I'm not sure if we read that verse. That's down there in verse number 16. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And verse number 17, While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Everything that he had. He was the greatest man in the East. And everything that he had, in one instance, was gone. That's what Satan would like to do to you. Do you understand that? Everything that you ever worked for in your life, he'd like to take it right away from you. To rip it right away from you. You know, I got to thinking about this a little bit, and about our possessions, Pastor Price. And I got to thinking, you know, I wonder why... Um, Satan doesn't take some of our possessions away from us today. And other than God's protection, and God's hedge of protection about us that keeps Satan from doing that, I believe Satan actually uses our possessions today to keep us distracted from the Lord. You know, if he can't take your possessions away from you, he's going to get you so enthralled with your possessions that you focus everything in your life on them, and then you don't care about God anymore. You know, it can be something as simple as a car, right? Hey, man, I wanted a car so bad when I was a lot of you guys' age, right? My first car my parents got me, it was a Chevrolet a Z24, pretty sick little car. But you know what? It was mine, and I love that thing, right? Man, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to wash that car, wax that car, detail that car, take care of that car, spend all my time and energy on this car, right? Uh, it wasn't long after that, I actually upgraded, and I got a Toyota Supra. That's a pretty nice car. Had a set-off hard top, right? I mean, this thing was nice. In fact, I had that car when I met my wife, so you know why she said yes, you know? And it's, and it's, <laughs> so now I drive a minivan, and she complains about that, you know? But, you know, you know, I had, I, had a, I had a sharp, hot car at one point in time. But you know what? If we're not careful, and we can let our possessions, we can let our possessions distract us from the Lord. And not, that's, Satan's, that's Satan's work in your life. It's getting you to focus somewhere where you should not be focused. Right. Nerf guns are really cool, but man, we could even lose focus on that, couldn't we? I mean, the real focus today isn't the Nerf war, it's the preaching of the Word of God. Right? So let's just remember, our possessions are actually tools that God gives us that we can use to then serve Him. You know, I was talking to a buddy of mine not long ago, and I, I said something about, or he was talking about his car or something, and he had used it to, well, I don't know, loan it out to some. I, I forget exactly the details of it, right? But I'm like, wow, that was really nice. And he's like, it's not my car. I thought, boy, what a great perspective to have on it. Somebody needed something that he had, he just loaned it away. He gave it to me of serving the Lord with his possessions, right? You know, our possessions can be used against us. But you know, Satan would just love to just take them all completely away from you. He'd love to destroy you. You know, Satan hates God. Satan hates you. And Satan hates anything that can bring glory to God. And if he had his way, he'd destroy everything that you've ever worked for in your life. Everything that you own. Everything that your parents own, he'd take it away. Not only that, but how many sons and daughters did he have? Do you remember? How many sons did he have? Seven. How many girls did he have? Three. Three, so he had ten children. Okay. The next thing I want us to see here is that Satan desires to destroy your family. 
Satan desires to destroy your family. Job chapter 1. I told you I didn't want to preach this message. I don't enjoy preaching it, but it's the truth, okay? Look in verse number 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are what? Dead. They are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell them. Satan wants to destroy your family. And I tell you what, I love my family. I love my wife. I love my two girls. I love my parents. I love Emily's parents. I love my family. I want nothing but what's best for my family. You know what? Satan wants to destroy my family. Satan wants to destroy my family. He wants to hurt my children. He wants to hurt you guys. He wants to hurt all of you. If Satan had his way, he'd really mess up your family. Now I've got tears in my eyes because I think that's pretty bad. In Mark, you don't have to turn there, you can stay there in Job, but in Mark chapter 9, I just want to read something about it. And it's not specifically taking about talking about Satan here, but talking about somebody who was demon-possessed in the Old Testament. And I'm just, again, just considering what, what is the desires here? What, what's taking place? And in Mark chapter 9, the Bible says this in verse number 20. It says, And they brought him unto him, this demon-possessed man. And when he, Jesus, saw him, straightway the Spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground, wallowing, foaming. And he asked his father, so this is his son, his father's there, and his father's pleading for this man. How long ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. You know, Satan's desires, even for a child, child, is to have him foaming and wallowing on the ground. And then it goes on and says, and oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire. This evil spirit had cast him into the fire. And then it had cast him into the waters, both to destroy him, to burn him, to drown him, to kill him. You can read all throughout the pages of Scripture and you can find about the attacks of Satan on people. And he's trying to destroy families. I think that Satan's doing a wonderful job of that in the United States of America. He's tearing families apart. He's destroying families. That's what Satan does. That's what he wants to do. For those of you who are married, Satan hates your spouse. For those of you who have children and grandchildren, Satan hates them. He'd love to just take them from you. Satan desires also to destroy your life. Are you still in Job? Look in Job chapter 2. First, Satan takes away everything that Job had ever owned and possessed. He took away his possessions. Second, he took away his family. And then third, he took away his health. He destroyed Job's very life. He took away his health. There are young people hanging in there, sitting up straight, listening and paying attention. I think everybody's doing a really good job tonight. Look at it in Job chapter 2 and verse number 1. Well, let's just skip down there through there a little bit, and let's go down to verse number 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, You know what? Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took unto him a pot sir, to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. He took his health. So that in order to get relief, he took a broken piece of pottery and he would scrape his flesh of the dead skin that was coming up from the boils and he would set in ashes somehow or another for relief. And this is what Satan wants to do to all of us. Do you believe that Satan is real? When's the last time you thought, though, about the dangers of letting Satan have his way in your life? You know what? Well, we don't really think about that, do we? We ought to. It might affect our decisions a little bit. That Satan is real and he's seeking, walking about seeking whom he may devour in this earth. We could look at other passages of Scripture, but I won't do that tonight. No, not from the, path, the book of Job, but from a verse over in Ephesians. I'm just going to flip over there and read it to you. Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says this, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 27, the Bible says, Neither give place to the devil. 
This is a fascinating verse. In other words, there are choices that you can make in your life that will give Satan the opportunity to do exactly what he wants to do to you. What does Satan want to do to you? He wants to take all your possessions. What does he want to do to you? He wants to destroy your family. And he wants to destroy your health. Neither give place to the devil. You know, it's three obvious things that you can do to give place to the devil. The first one I have down here is alcohol. You know, you can choose. You can choose. You can make the choice that you're going to, you're going to drink alcohol. Right? You can make the choice. You can go out and you can drink beer. You can go drink wine. You can do whatever it is that you want to do. But when you do that, you are giving ground to Satan. That's you're right. giving him place yes. to do what he wants to do in your life. How many alcoholics do you know that have great families? Mm. How many people have lost their lives because they drink alcohol? Mm. How many people have lost their families because they drink alcohol? How many people have spent every dime that they have to go and buy more alcohol and they've lost everything that they own? Hmm? You want to drink alcohol, you go right ahead. But listen, you are giving your, your life to Satan. You're giving your family away. You're giving your possessions away. You're giving your health away. And you are playing right into the devil's hands. And then he gets to do with you what he wants to do. Or you can follow God. And he can bless your life. He can give you a strong, great family. But do you understand that your choices play into that? Your choices. Your choices. Drugs are the same way, aren't they? Man, drugs are so prevalent in our society. You guys are going to go back to school next week. You're going to see them. Right? Don't they change hands right in front of you? Hey, you could choose to take them. But when you do, you're giving place to the devil. And he's going to use them to destroy you. What about immorality? Hmm? Does God want you to be intimate with a girl before you get married? He doesn't, does he? This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. Last year when I was here, I preached a whole message on that. Some of you guys weren't here. Listen, you want to play right into the desires of Satan? You do things with girls you shouldn't do. You know what I'm talking about. You'll ruin your life. You'll ruin your life because you're playing right into the desires of Satan. You can give ground to Satan. I want to tell you as we conclude here tonight, I'm not going to be long. I want to tell you about a time in my life where I gave Satan ground. Stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. I went to college. I wanted to be an engineer. So I went to North Carolina State University. So when I got there, I said, well, I need to find, I need to find a church to, to be a part of. And uh, so I went, and uh, on campus there at North Carolina State University was the Baptist Student Union. So I said, this is going to be great. I'm going to go in there, and I'll meet some nice, nice friends, and I'll get to know them. I went in there. They were the most godless bunch of people I'd ever been around in my life. I'm like, man, this is, this is not where God is, you know. I said, so I can't come here. And there's more to that story that I'm not going to tell you, but nonetheless. Came home and said, okay, well, that's not the answer. And uh, I didn't have a car. Well, I did have a car, but it was a, a miles walk away. And I was lazy, I guess, so I wasn't going to walk over to my car. And um, so there was a church that was meeting on campus. And it wasn't the kind of church that I was used to going to, but I said, well, I'll go there. Well, I went there, and it just didn't work out either. That was not, that's not what God was wanting me to do either, you know. And uh, I needed a good church. I needed a church like this. I needed a pastor like Pastor Price that would, that would love me as a teenager and, and help me through my college years. But you know what? I tried a couple of times. I tried going to a couple of different places. Just couldn't find anything what I liked. So I, then I made, I made the dumbest decision that I've ever made in my life, and I gave ground to the devil. I said, okay, I'm not going to go to church. I said, I'm not going to go. Now Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says this. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, is what the Bible is saying here. Don't forsake 
church. Don't walk away from church. But you know what? That's what I did. That's what I did. And young people, I have scars from that time period of my life that I wish I didn't have. Because I gave ground to Satan. I, I gave it over to him. I got involved in some of the stuff that I've mentioned already tonight. And I'm ashamed of that time period in my life. And I have regrets from that time period in my life where I wasn't walking with the Lord. I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing. And I told myself when I became a preacher that if I get a chance to talk to young people like you guys, I'm going to tell them what happened to me so it won't happen to them. Satan wants to destroy you. Maybe you don't have a wife yet, but you might one day. Protect your purity. Protect it. Because you want to be able to give it away one day. Satan doesn't want you to do that. Satan wants you to be pure. He wants you to lose it. He wants to destroy you. He wants to give you scars. He wants to give you regrets. He wants to destroy your possessions. He wants to destroy your family. And he wants to destroy you. I hate preaching this message. But it is so true. It is so true. Let me tell you what I would do if I was any one of you guys. Every time there's a service here, I'd be here. He didn't tell me to say that. He didn't pay me to say that. I'm telling you, from my past experiences, if I were you, I'd find a way to be here. I'd be here Sunday morning. I'd be here Sunday night. I'd be here Wednesday night. I'd be here Saturday. Y'all have youth meetings on Saturdays at 7, right? 6? What time are you? So sometime on Saturday, I'd be here. And I'd be here. I'd be here. I would not choose to forsake the assembly of yourselves together. From my own experiences and from what the Bible says about the desires of Satan, I wouldn't do it. I'd be in the house of God. I'd be ascending under the preaching of His Word. I'd be following what God wants to do, me to, how, how God wants me to live my life. And that way I could be a wise man, I'd be a blessed man, and so on and so forth, like we talked about at the very beginning of this week. That's what I would do. I challenge y'all with that. Okay? The devil's real. And God is real. We're not talking about some silly thing. I'm talking about real life. And I'm challenging you guys. I'm challenging you to live for the Lord. Do what's right. Find out what God wants from you to do it. Don't give ground to Satan. Okay? Pastor Price, I've got two more minutes left, but I think I've done. That's it. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you for telling us about the desires of Satan. Lord, no doubt, as I've been preaching this message tonight, I don't know how you've been speaking specifically to individuals, but I know that you have. And Lord, whether it be with the adults in the back, the teenagers up here in the front, Lord, if you've showed them an area where they're giving ground to Satan, God, I ask that you'd help them to give up that ground. Lord, give them strength to get rid of some things in their life. Lord, maybe there's somebody here who just needs to recommit to being at church so that they can obey the Bible and quit forsaking the assembling of themselves together. Lord, whatever it is, I ask that your will will be done as Pastor Christ comes and closes tonight's service. Lord, we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Amen. Christ, I'm going to turn the invitation over to you. Okay. Satan wants to destroy you. And he's your enemy and not your friend. <clears throat> That's one of the one of the best messages we could have heard. We all need that, don't we? We all need to be reminded about that again, again, and again, and again. And Satan can destroy any of you. He can destroy any of you. He wants to destroy your soul. And if God saved you, He can't. So what He wants to do is destroy everybody else. And He can destroy them by destroying you. He can destroy your family by destroying you. You know, none of us live in ourselves. None of us die into ourselves. And... Uh, God wants to do something amazing with your life. 
I just, I see, I see uh, so many young people in this room this evening, and I'll just tell you something, the rest of us that aren't so young, it thrills our hearts because we know what God could do with you. Amen. And we just know. I mean, I'm not talking about later on when you get to be Brother Duke's age. He's a good preacher. And God's using him. I'm talking about Brother Duke can't go in your school and get the teenagers to come to church like you can, like some of y'all did. I mean, God's using you right now. You, you came, you had a friend that invited you uh, to come to the preaching services, and honestly, it could, it, this literally could be a time when you just do a U-turn in your life, and it's because God used your friend as a teenager. Sometimes we think in terms of age when it comes to importance to serving God. What's better, to get a child to come to the Lord, a teenager to come to the Lord, or an adult to come to the Lord? Well, a soul's a soul as far as God's concerned. A person's a person. And you young folks, God can use you right now. Right now. I mean, you could this Wednesday have testified of Jesus Christ and bring people uh, to the Lord. But I promise you, when God begins to use you, there's someone who hates you who wants to have at you. And the very categories Brother Duke mentioned this evening are areas where you could give place. And you could say, okay, you can destroy me. That's what you're saying when you make those decisions. You won't be the first person. You won't be the first person to play with sin and have it give you some kind of good results. Most people think, well, you know what? They weren't very smart when they sinned. <laughs> well, you're right. No one who sins is very intelligent. No one who gives place to the devil is very smart. And neither are you. And so thank you, Brother Duke, for that message. I think we should make a decision on the basis of that. And I just I don't think it'll be a come forward. But real quick, I'd like to ask everyone in this room, adults and teenagers alike, if you would uh, for a moment bow your heads and uh, close your eyes. I'd just like to ask uh, by just, just a very, very simple question. I want to ask two questions. One that I always want to ask, and that is, uh, you're here, you've been in several of the services this week, or maybe it's your first service. But you say, Pastor, God has dealt with my heart. There's a matter that I'm not sure that I've settled, and that is the matter of, am I even God's child? You're one or the other. You, you are either God's enemy who's going to be judged by God, or you're His child. You say, Pastor, I'm not, I don't have clarity. I don't know that that heaven's my home and that God is my Father. I don't know that I've been saved. Brother Duke's preached about it over and over again, but I'm still not sure. I don't know that I'm saved. If that's you, uh, please, would you, would you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed and, and afford your friends the privacy to be able to slip their hand up right now and say, you know, Pastor, don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But uh, I don't know that I'm saved, and I'm concerned about that right now. I realize this is a serious matter. Uh, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up right now. Pastor, I don't know that I'm saved. Just slip your hand up and let me know that. I won't call you out or embarrass you. The second part of the uh, invitation tonight, when we give an invitation, what we're doing is inviting you to make a decision on the basis of what's been preached. The second part of the invitation tonight is just really simple. You know, Pastor, I've been made aware. I've been made aware that I am the one who gives the Satan the opportunity to destroy me. And now that I've realized that, now that I've re realized that, I'm going to be vigilant about that matter with God's help. And I need God's help, and I want you to pray for me. I've made a decision tonight that I'm not giving place. Yep, just slip your hand up right now. Just slip it up. I see it. Slip it back down. Yep, that's it. Just up it right back down. That's it. Okay, so a number of individuals have made that decision. Let's have just a second. Let's just have a couple of seconds, and let's take a, a moment to just tell God what you've told me. And then if you need help, you may, may want to go to Brother Duke and say, Brother Duke, what are some things I can do? Man, some of the things he told you. Going to church and uh, getting in your Bible and, and doing what's in your Bible. Those things will help you. What are some things I can do? And uh, he'll be available right after. So let's just go ahead and, and have a moment where we commit those things you decided to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for condescending to unworthy individuals like ourselves to give us truth that we needed to hear. And I ask that You would 
God, just help this truth to be ringing in our ears. And Lord, help it to be cemented in our minds. God, I'm at a place where I forget so many things. And Lord, this is a truth that I cannot forget. I need to remember it. I need to be vigilant because there's an adversary who wants to destroy me. God, for these teenagers, Lord, these are important, vital years of their life where You're already using them and You're going to do even more in their future. And I ask You to help them be vigilant because they have an adversary who's trying to destroy them. God, thank You that every bit as much as the Satan hates You and hates us, that You love us even more than that. And I pray that that truth would be something that draws us to You and helps us to resist the devil. With Your help, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alright, you're dismissed from the service tonight. In just about a few minutes when the pizza gets here, we're going to have our uh, teen pizza party and then an activity. And then the second service. Adults, you're welcome to, to hang out. Please make sure that the teenagers uh, get food before you, you participate in it. There will be pizza and hot dogs and some things. And I think everybody is uh, welcome. So, Alright, uh, you're dismissed. Thank mm -hmm. you.